Our next speaker, Jackson Washburn, is a 19-year-old freshman pursuing a major in religious studies from Arizona State University. Raised in an interfaith household, his passions include Mormon and religious studies and interfaith activism. He is the current youth advisor for the Arizona interfaith movement, has spoken at venues such as the Parliament of the World's Religions and the United Nations, and is looking to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints this summer. Please welcome Jackson. Um, so <clears throat> before I start, I just want to give a warm thank you to the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Um, the reason I'm here, I believe, is uh, because of French toast, as uh, weird as that might sound. About a year ago, um, I was uh, taken out to brunch by uh, Blair Osler, uh, Carl Youngblood, um, Nathan Hadfield, and Lincoln Cannon. And uh, they, uh, we engaged in some good conversation, and uh, they uh, extended a, a, a healthy invite uh, to consider joining the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Um, and uh, funnily enough, I, uh, um, I remember uh, you know, leaving that, uh, the, the brunch and uh, after returning home uh, to Arizona, talking to my dad about it, you know, he asked me how it was, and I'm like, oh, you know, they're really nice, but they're a bit too eccentric for me. I don't, I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if I'll ever, you know, do anything with the MTA. But a year later, it looks like I've changed my mind. So <laughs> I've, I've come around. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, transfiguration and divine embodiment in the Hindu and Latter-day Saint tradition. Um, and I'll begin with a um, kind of uh, I engaging with a summary of what I'm to be speaking of. Uh, the conceptualization of divine embodiment in Western uh, religious thought uh, is often deeply tied to works of literature and sacred myths found within the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, lesser known and equally striking instances of such can also be found within the wider corpus of Vedic scripture, an example of such being depicted in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Krishna reveals his universal form to the mortal prince Arjuna. Uh, though certainly a minority perspective when compared to its matured theological predecessors, uh, Mormonism likewise carries within its theological tradition a rich and dynamic emphasis on the materiality of the divine and their respective corporeal interchanges with mortals. Uh, such as textually exemplified uh, by various accounts in the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon, as well as in several pivotal events in the Mormon Restoration. Uh, this uh, presentation will analyze the themes of transfiguration, theophany, incarnation, uh, as held within the traditions of Hinduism and Mormonism, uh, giving credence to their similarities as well as their points of difference uh, on a metaphysical, textual, and theological basis. Uh, with special emphasis being given to the conducive nature of divine embodiment with Mormon transhumanism, uh, demonstrating that while much of its terminology might be unfamiliar, uh, Latter-day Saints can stand to benefit greatly by studying the parallel narrative elements and spiritual themes held uh, between the Bhagavad Gita and their own sacred texts. Uh, and it looks like I have about 12 minutes to do that or so. Um, so don't expect too much, right? I can, you know, uh, we won't go too deep. Um, but uh, here we have a, a picture of uh, uh, the theophany that Moses experiences uh, as recorded in the Book of Moses and the one uh, that Arjuna experiences uh, uh, at um, the feet of Krishna uh, within the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so to start, uh, we need to kind of uh, understand what transfiguration is, especially within a Mormon context, considering uh, this is the MTA, right? Um, so. The prophet Joseph Smith explained that, uh, quote, God dwells in eternal fire. Uh, flesh and blood cannot go there, for all corruption is devoured by the fire. Uh, and then he goes to say that our God is a consuming fire, uh, which has uh, many uh, parallel biblical uh, themes as well. Um, Within the New Testament, uh, with the transfiguration of Christ, we have the description uh, that his face did shine as the sun and his raiment uh, was white as the light. Uh, that's in Matthew 17, too. 
spiritual change, allowing them to not only behold the glory of God, but to enter his presence. It is characterized by illumination of countenance, such as Moses experienced, as we'll uh, elaborate, and comes about by an infusion of God's power. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a physical and a spiritual element uh, to the process of transfiguration. Um, Doctrine and Covenants uh, 67, 11, uh, through 12 says, For no man has seen God at any time in the flesh, except quickened by the Spirit of God. Neither can any natural man abide the presence of God, neither after the carnal mind. Um, and so transfiguration, as we'll see, uh, has uh, some very interesting implications uh, for those involved with its process. Um, so to set uh, a, a context, um, we must first comprehend um, kind of the setting of the subjects at hand. Um, so we'll begin with two mortals uh, separated by time, space, and mythic textual traditions. Uh, and they'll be the subject of our analysis moving forward. And there, Moses is described in the Book of Moses and Arjuna within the Bhagavad Gita. Um, the Bhagavad Gita being a sacred text stemming from the Hindu tradition, uh, aptly described as containing a summary of all the essentials of Vedic teachings. Um, the Gita begins in the midst of the great uh, Kurukshetra War, uh, wherein two warring families, the Kauravas and the Pandavas, uh, don't mind my pronunciation, I probably butchered that. Uh, they make battle over control of the throne, uh, said to have set in what is now known as the Haryana region of contemporary India. Uh, fighting for the Pandavas, the warrior prince Arjuna uh, finds himself at the helm of his, his army, uh, the time for the two sides to meet in combat rapidly approaching. Let me see. Um, as should be expected, the brutality of the conflict and the number of lives that have been lost therein uh, causes Arjuna to take a massive psychological blow, especially as he considers the identity of those standing opposed to him on the other side. Uh, grandfathers, uncles, brothers, grandsons, even Arjuna's childhood mentor, uh, Drona, stands on the army opposite him. Um, and with the embodied god Krishna as his advisor, uh, he says, O oh Krishna, seeing our own people standing near, eager to fight, my limbs weaken and my mouth dries up. My body trembles, my hair stand up, my bow slips from my hand, and truly my skin burns. I have no power to stand. My mind reels, O oh Krishna, and I see ill omens. I foresee no good in killing our own people in battle, and seek neither victory nor kingdom nor pleasures. So shaken, disheartened, and disenfranchised from the conflict he is overseeing, Arjuna experiences the damaging effects of the war firsthand, albeit on a mental and emotional level. Uh, this spiritual nadir then sets him up to be instructed in eternal wisdom by Krishna, uh, who seeks to confide in him what are considered by many to be the principal teachings of all Vedic literature, touching on the nature of divinity, true worship, individual dharma or duty, and many other spiritual facets of the Hindu system. Uh, so, serving as a climax for this sacred text is the cosmic vision that Krishna bestows upon Arjuna after being prompted to show him his true form. Uh, and this will find comparison uh, in the book of Moses, wherein the prophet Moses experiences several cosmic visions and theophanies. Um, and uh, to give a similar context for the book of Moses, um, contrary to uh, what many might, uh, within the Latter-day Saint tradition, might think, um, the book of Moses would be best described as a kind of a, a scriptural pseudepigrapha. Um, so from a literary perspective, uh, the revelation features a biblical-like inclusio, uh, bracketing the text through the repetition of key words in its introduction and conclusion. I'm, I'm quoting David Bakavoy here in his author in the Old Testament. Um, beginning with the superscription in Moses 1.1, uh, the revelation then concludes 41 verses later with an editorial colophon that repeats key thematic elements from the beginning of the text. Moses is set. Um, and the, the, the scene is set in, uh, with Moses being on top of a mountain, which has parallel themes in Ezekiel, um, Revelation, 1 Nephi, and uh, other um, passages of scripture within the Mormon canon. Um, and uh, you know, to kind of bolster my um, belief that uh, it's best described as pseudepigrapha, um, we have an omniscient narrator in the text uh, speaking about Moses in the first person. Uh, the text itself does not view Moses as the author. Um, and so thus, I think, uh, as well as Richard Bushman, um, that it should be described as pseudepigrapha. So moving forward, now that, that we kind of had the, the two scenes set, 
Um, Moses uh, um, also in his uh, experience in the book of Moses, which is a rather short book of scripture, um, he experiences several visions, like I mentioned, uh, some of them with, with God, uh, some of them with uh, the devil. Um, and um, so, you know, he has some interesting experiences that also teach him about the nature of God, the existence, humanity, and uh, so on and so forth. So moving forward, uh, my focus at ASU deals with a text practice and representation. So I do a lot of textual work. And so we're going to try and put these two texts in dialogue because that's where I think the benefit is. Um, so, uh, you know, from the narrative structure and thematic elements, um, uh, as, as you've likely read, um, that's what happens to Krishna moving forward uh, with the transfiguration of Moses. Moses experiences some similar things as well. Uh, so he's shown the whole of creation. Uh, Moses, after being transfigured, returns to his natural state. Uh, it causes him to more fully realize the gulf between divinity and humanity. He's shown a secondary cosmic vision. And so there's different parallel themes that we'll explore. Um, so Krishna, or Arjuna, um, specifically starts off um, with uh, what is, oh, let me uh, go back. Uh, wh what is a desire to see God's true form? He says, O Lord, you are as you have said, yet I wish to see your divine cosmic form, O supreme being. O Lord, if you think it's possible for me to see your universal form, then O Lord of the yogis, show me your transcendental form. Uh, and uh, Lord Krishna says in response, O Arjuna, behold my hundreds and thousands of multifarious divine forms of different colors and shapes. Behold all the celestial beings and wonders never seen before. Um, also behold the entire creation, animate and animate, and whatever else you'd like to see all at one place in my body. Um, but you are not able to see me with your physical eye. Therefore, I give you the divine eye to see my majestic power and glory. We turn to the book of Moses. And he saw God face to face, and he talked with him. And the glory of God was upon Moses. Therefore, Moses could endure his presence. Uh, Moses, just like Arjuna, is given some type of spiritual um, uh, assistance in order to uh, withstand being in the presence of God. Um, and uh, it, it's then that they see... Um, God in a more uh, heightened uh, or uh, super uh, sense. Arjuna uh, saw the universal form of the Lord with many mouths and eyes, many visions of marvel, and numerous divine ornaments. Um, he describes them, if the splendor of a thousand suns were to blaze forth all at once in the sky, even that would not resemble the splendor of that exalted being. So where else do we find parallels of that within Mormonism? You know, I think I'm going to be using that one in the first discussion uh, on my mission. Um, it, in the, uh, let's see, Arjuna saw the entire universe divided in many ways, but standing is all in one and one and all in the transcendental body of Krishna, the Lord of celestial rulers. We have Moses with, uh, well, God speaking to Moses, behold, I am the Lord God almighty and endless is my name for I am without beginning of days or end of years. And is this not endless? And uh, behold, um, I will show you the, the workmanship of my hands and not all for my works are without end and also my words for they never cease. Um, then we have uh, Arjuna after being uh, given this experience, um, he becomes afraid. It becomes too much for him to handle. Uh, perhaps the, the supernatural assistance that he's been given uh, begins to wear off because uh, he cries out to Krishna for mercy uh, to descend back into his lesser form. Um, and we also see something similar uh, with Moses. I'm running short on time, but... Uh, um, and it came to pass, Moses looked and beheld the world upon which he was created. Um, and of the same, he greatly marveled and wondered. Um, and then we are told that the presence of God withdraws from Moses. His glory was not upon Moses. And Moses was left unto himself. And as he was left unto himself, he fell to the earth. And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did again receive his natural strength, like unto man. And he said unto himself, now for this cause I know that man is nothing, uh, which thing I had never had supposed. Um, later in the Bhagavad Gita, we have uh, Lord Krishna saying, Arjuna, I am pleased with you. I have shown you through my own yogic powers, this particular supreme, shining, universal, infinite, and primal form of mine that has never before been seen by anyone other than you. Um, switching to a different Book of Mormon scripture, the Book of Ether contained in, uh, within the Book of Mormon, um, we have a, a similar theophany taking place with the brother of Jared, with God, uh, wherein uh, Christ says, um, Behold, this, this body which ye now behold is the body of my spirit, and man have I created after the body of spirit. Um, he, he says, And never have I shown myself unto man whom I have created, for never has man believed in me as thou hast. Um, 
So uh, the brother of Jared is given a, a vision, um, and uh, similar wording is used where uh, you know the deity in question says, "You you are special. You are unique. I've never given anyone a, a vision quite like this." Um, we can uh, continue forward, um, and. Uh, we have Krishna saying, the one who does all works for me and to whom I am the supreme goal, who is my devotee, uh, who has no attachment and is free from enmity towards in being, attains me, O Arjuna. And uh, where else better than, you know, perhaps the Gospel of Matthew do we hear, the blesser, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, the Bhagavad Gita and the Christian Gospels uh, um, both have this theme that uh, it is the pure in heart. It is when we are cleansed, we transcend. We are transfigured into a state higher than this that goes beyond our own uh, carnal insecurities and weaknesses, uh, that we are able to fully withstand the presence of God. Um, and that is all um, so that uh, we... Uh, can participate in bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Um, now, of course, there's uh, similarities and differences uh, between Hinduism and Mormonism. I don't nearly have enough time to uh, elaborate on all of them. I wish I did. It's very interesting stuff for me. Um, but uh, one thing that's uh, um, similar in both um, is that uh, um, uh, that we've seen in the book of Moses and in the Bhagavad Gita is that mortal transfiguration precedes increased cosmic knowledge. Um, it is this increased capacity that we are given that uh, allows us to receive that knowledge, come to a higher understanding. Uh, today we've already been talking about uh, you know the limits of uh, human uh, cognitive abilities and how we might expand that. Well. You know, uh, I think that very aptly describes the process of transfiguration, of us transcending to a higher state. Um, that mortals can take on attributes of deity, like, you know, having higher capacities for knowledge like that, like being able to withstand that kind of divine light or glory. Um, but, you know, as a warning, this increased knowledge should lead to humility and increased devotion. We see this both in the Book of Moses and in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, wherein uh, the, the two individuals who are transfigured and uh, experience these visions, um, at the end, they don't become arrogant or prideful or, you know, feel like now that they have seen these visions that uh, they can hold that against others, that they are holier than thou. Uh, instead, they are that much more devoted to serving God, uh, to loving others, uh, uh, and that they've truly changed their state into one that is closer to God. Um, and uh, to further understand these principles, at least for us as Mormons, Latter-day Saints, and I would just say people in general, um, we must seek out the best books, words of wisdom, I'm quoting the Doctrine and Covenants here, uh, to guide technological, spiritual, and societal advancement. Um, it's by taking different traditions, putting them in dialogue with one another, that we're able to see their similarities and differences, that we're able to see where some work more than other, uh, um, better than others. And uh, I think this is a very Mormon activity and one that we should all be anxiously engaged in. Um, I'm going to end with this quote um, and, uh, well, two more, two quotes, including this one. Uh, Philip Barlow says that, uh, uh, he's a Mormon scholar, um, says that if certain truths were not originally included in the Bible, they are truths nonetheless. Uh, and readers will be edified by studying them. It is not the text of the Bible as such, or just any scripture, uh, but rather the truths of God that are sacred. We can get these truths by studying different books of wisdom. Um, Spencer W. Kimball, and I'll close with this, says, is it hard to project ourselves from the elemental world of puny man to the world of omnipotent God, who with great purpose has developed precision instruments operated through his omnipotent knowledge? Is it difficult to believe that the Urim and Thummim carried down through the ages by the prophets, even in the hands of our own modern day prophet, could be that precision instrument which would transmit messages from God himself to his supreme creation, man and women? Um, can God have limitations? Can atmosphere, or distance, or space hold back his pictures? Would it be so difficult for Moses or Enoch or Abraham or Joseph to see a colorful, accurate, moving picture of all things past and present and even future? Could one doubt that the holy man, Moses, could stand on the mountaintop and see? And so I hope that all of us uh, moving forward uh, desire to stand on top of this holy mountain, uh, to have these uh, visions for ourselves, because I believe that uh, uh, the religion of Mormonism affords us this capacity and uh, invites us to partake in such. And so I want to close with that. Thank you.